Amen. Praise God for that song that was given to us at this moment. Um, I truly want to just praise God that the battle is not ours. Uh, it's the Lord's. And so together we can truly be encouraged at the sound, under the sound of my voice, that God has all things in control. I want us to open up our Bibles. We're going to, if you can, for a few moments, I also, as you see, the scripture is going to be found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. And if you can uh, also get a sheet of paper and, and, some, um, and a pen, uh, we're going to have some scriptures that we're going to go over today because we're, we're looking at a battle right now. And so I would like for you to uh, also, again, get a sheet of paper for those who have a, want to use your tablet or phone or some electronic device or take notes, that'd be fine as well. Uh, but in this, we, we're looking at some operatives that we got to look at. And again, it says from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. It says, finally, my brethren, <clears throat> be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil ones. Can somebody say all? Put it on the chat line. Someone type in all. All the fiery darts of the evil one, of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I'm going to say read to you right now, verses 11 to 13. Put on the whole arm of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And 13 says, therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Today I'd like to share with you the sermon title is called The Full Attire. The full attire. If you would like to, if you can, will you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, thank you so very much uh, for this day. Lord, uh, this is one week after uh, the evangelistic meeting has ended. Lord, uh, we are still continuing on in each day, each minute, each second, each breath of our lives. Lord, knowing that you're soon to come back, realizing that you're soon to come back, uh, but Lord, it is not going to get easier on this earth. In fact, it's going to get more difficult because the devil knows that each second, each breath that we breathe is one second closer to his ultimate death. So he is going to do whatever he can to attack us. So Lord, we pray that we will take these words that you have shared to us in your, in your word, uh, that, they, that they will be applicable and impactful in our lives and those around us. Lord, we pray for the church, the members and those who will one day eventually join the church. And Lord, when it's all said and done, bring us to your, your kingdom where you told us that there'll be a number that no man can number. So Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts to be holy and acceptable in your sight, truly our Lord and truly our Redeemer. Let us all say together, amen, amen, and amen. The full attire. We are in a time where we have been around, around with information of, of things of war. Uh, for those who were born in the, the, the 80s and more so the 90s, you grew up in an environment, especially the early, uh, early turn of the, this millennial, when ever since 9-11, uh, uh, there was an issue talking about weapons of mass destruction. And that's weapons of mass destruction 
that for, start, start to lead forth to the aspect of going to war against Al Qaeda. Uh, first of all, you know, in that the Taliban and Al Qaeda, uh, uh, the various things that have been going forth. We're not even seeing not necessarily a war in, 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 uh, with America in another country per se, but we're even seeing a war in America right now. It is a civil kind of war where it is a battle, unfortunately, between people who have different looks on their color of their skin and, and people who are battling in different political parties and, and saying that, that some people say black lives matter. We all recognize that black lives matter, but then other people say all lives matter, which is true. But if you recognize all lives matter, then you have to also include black people in it. We are looking at a, a war that's going forth. And, and one thing as we have seen for those who are a little bit older, those who are the baby boomers and older generation, you remember Vietnam War. Uh, Vietnam War lasted all, around 10 years and, and what it caused, more than 10 years, I'm sorry, and what it caused for those people in, in Vietnam and what it caused for, for people, for those who understand the war that happened in, 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 in Afghanistan and that happened in the Middle East in my generation and younger, that those wars ultimately ended up into two things. The first one is death and the other one is destruction. In fact, I actually just let you know, I was watching a video and, and, and the video was speaking about what happened in Vietnam. I heard about, for those who are familiar, there's something called Agent Orange. And Agent Orange is, is something that is very similar to a certain degree, but it's more potent, it's stronger than like Roundup. You know, for those who have a yard and you're trying to kill off those weeds, uh, as long as the grass is not in the area, and even if the grass is in the area, you spray some Roundup on that sucker, those weeds and the grass, everything around it will, will, will be killed eventually. But Agent Orange was an element that was flown over and poured out on the terrain of, of Vietnam. And what it did was, as it got it, it destroyed the foliage because the, the people, the Vietnamese army um, soldiers, as they were trying to fight, they would hide in the bushes. And so the idea was to defoliate, to destroy the, the, the leaves, so that the military could attack and, and destroy the enemy. Now, it did do its part, but even now, some 50 years later, 50 plus years later, there are ramifications of Agent Orange. There are children who were born in defect because of their parents who were impacted by Agent Orange. For those who may have inhaled it, those who may have had it in, in their system, in their blood. When they had children, there were deformities that the children got because their parents were impacted from Agent Orange. War brings nothing but death and destruction. And there's a man who, who wrote a song and said, war, what is it good for? And for those who remember, it says absolutely nothing. It, war has brought havoc and, and, and pain and, and, and dis disarray to the whole sphere of humanity. It's gone on since heaven. The Bible tells us that there was a war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and, and praise God that the dragon and his angels may try to be, bring carnage to heaven, but, but praise God, Michael defeated the dragon and kicked the dragon out. And, and yes, praise God, the angels in heaven are rejoicing, but the Bible says, woe unto you, O inhabitants of earth, for the devil knows that he has but a short time the war that is in heaven has now been translated here on planet Earth. And so when we look at this, we have to recognize that we as followers of Christ are in a spiritual battle. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, that the book of Ephesians being closed off, that Paul is writing this last chapter, and as he's talking to, his, he's talking to the Ephesians, he's warning them and reminding them of this importance of this battle that we are in. See, in this battle that we are in, this is, can look at it in aspect. The Roman army, as he was focusing on in the illustration, the Roman army is a military might that even their tactics are still used today. Now I'm gonna share with you a couple of their tactics. There's three of them that one, one, one writer wrote, and it's called, one is called the Tesudo, and it's kind of like a, a, a tortoise, and, and what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a Roman shield called, and, and allowed them to present a 360 degree wall of wood to their opponents. The opponents may have tried to come at them, but their defenses 
could not come at them. They were protected against the attacks of the enemy because they were around each other. The other one is called the triple line. And one innovation that speaks about this is that it was an order of, of soldiers, front, another row, and then another row. The row of the, the newest soldiers were in the front. And it went in seniority. So more seniority, the next line, and the most seniority were in the back lines. And so those who were in the front line fought, and that was the way that they attacked. And then another one is called the wedge. And when they all came together with their, sh with their shield, and they went forth to the enemy, and they attacked them to defeat them. These tactics have been used even till today. And so when Paul used the illustration of the Roman army of putting on the whole armor of God, he then tells it to us is that we need this so that we can be able to stand against the attacks, the wiles of the devil. And I just want to share with you real quick, because this is a, a teaching message, because I, I want to say with those who understand my voice, especially the newly baptized, those, each and every one of us, no matter how long you've been in the church, for 50 years or 50 seconds, 50 minutes, 50 days, doesn't matter how long you've been a member of church, we all need to put on the whole armor, the full attire. Point, point number one is family. This is what Paul is saying, and this is what the Bible is pointing us to. Point, point, point number one is only God's armor can handle Satan's plots and plans. Can someone say amen? Only God's armor can handle Satan's plots and plans. See, we remember, the Bible tells in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The Bible doesn't say put on half the armor. The Bible doesn't say put on three quarters of an armor. The Bible says put on the whole armor of God so that you can be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, the Bible tells us that the devil is like a roaring lion and all he's doing is trying to find the weakest person, those who have seen videos. If you've seen videos, you have seen what happens with a lion. Lions, there is uh, the MGM lion. In fact, I actually didn't realize until just recently, a couple years ago, that that was a vegetarian lion. That lion did not eat meat. But the lions in the jungle, the lions in Africa, the lions in maybe even some parts of India, they're not vegetarians unless they don't get the food they're looking for, the prey. And lions operate in a prey, a, a, a group, a, 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 a group of lions, the, the main lion and then lionesses and then the cubs. And what they do is they focus on a particular animal, a group of animals. And even of that, they look for the, the youngest or they look for the weakest. Whichever one that they can get their attack and kill, they will do so. And so they will with precision focus on them and then come as a group to scatter the body, the group of animals, to focus on that one that they had already been looking and determined to get. The Bible says that the devil roar, lurks like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. As he is looking to devour us as followers of God, we were not told to put on three quarters or half or even one quarter even or anything less than the full armor of God because only God's armor can handle Satan's plots and plans. See, that's some good news, family, because if your weak spots are not protected, your weak spots will make you vulnerable. You see, the Roman soldiers had on a full attire. And because they had on a full attire, they were able to overcome and defeat their enemies for a prolonged period of time. And just like I said earlier, their methods of attack are even still used even nowadays. See, family, the Bible doesn't tell us just to put on a little bit. We have to have on the full armor of God to protect us from his plots and plans. That's why when David was going to fight Goliath, David was going to fight Goliath, Saul said, hey, wear my attire. Put on my armor. Put on my covering. But David said, I can't put this on because I haven't proven it. I, it, it, it doesn't fit me. I, I, you're the tallest man of Israel. I'm not. But one thing I am is I have confidence in a man bigger than the whole universe. And so when he saw the Goliath and he said, you may come, you know, you know, you may come at me, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. And so Goliath then runs at David and David without any attire that man could see, David had on the full armor of God 
because he was standing for God and went to Goliath with the first of his five smooth stones, whirled it and hit it in Goliath's head and killed him. When we have on the full armor, the spiritual armor of God, we'll be able to handle all the attacks and plans of the enemy. That's point number one, is that only God's armor can attack Satan's plots and plans. Don't you dare realize, family, that the times when you had been in temptation, the devil saw where you were at, he, and he tried to make you feel like you had to give up on God. What am I talking about? Uh, the, the time when you had only so much money, and the devil hid something in your house or something in your, your car or your, your whatever, your family situation, and it was a test of whether you will return your tithe, the 10% that belongs to him, or that you will keep it to pay on that bill. That's Satan's plots and plans. But if we are recognizing that when God asks us to return to him what he has already given to us, then we can trust that God will provide all the things that we need. When the devil tries to make you feel nervous, when a, when a coworker or when you're or when somebody in your neighborhood is trying to threaten you and you recognize that God is in control of it all, you can go to sleep and know that the battle is not yours. Like Yolanda Adam just saying, the battle is the Lord's. When we have confidence in God and we have on God's armor, it will give us the strength to handle Satan's plots and plans. Can somebody say amen? We don't have to be afraid about what's coming around us. We don't have to be afraid that what may seem to be ahead of us because when God is for us, who can be against us? We must have on the whole armor of God to handle Satan's plots and plans. That's point number one. Point number two is Satan will then send distractions to disrupt your development. Satan will send distractions to disrupt your development. Verse 12, it says, these are the wiles of the devil. And this is something we also have to recognize and and, you know, we have to keep this in our heads. And, you know, my mom used to say to me, you got to get this through your thick skull. Come on, y'all. Y'all you understand what I'm talking about. Say amen. If your parents said it to you or if you said it to your children, you got to get this through your thick skull. Get it through your thick skull, family. That Satan sends distractions to disrupt your development. Let's read what says in verse 12. The Bible says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The Bible tells us we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling with members of the church. We're not wrestling with our family who's getting on our nerves. We're wrestling with the elements that the devil is trying to put in that will cause us to think it's the person, but it's the person who the devil's been using, and he could be using you. Hey, let's keep on going. The devil will try to use people so that when I see someone getting on my nerves, I'm looking at the person instead of looking at the problem, like the, what the devil's coming through the devil. It, it, it's the thing, family, is that the devil will send distractions to disrupt your development. We are, as a body of believers, we go to church either in the building or on the, on the Zoom platform, we come to worship simply to grow in God and do service for him. We are not to come here to sit down just to listen to a message and then just criticize and critique it, but use nothing of the message to impact in our lives, to follow as a God and grow in his grace and knowledge. Satan will then, as he sees that, he will then send distractions to disrupt your development. When you, go to, when you go to church, when you go to prayer meeting, when you are attending Sabbath school, when you're in these meetings and you're learning, Satan will do whatever he can to distract you so that your development and growth in God will be disrupted. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers. When Daniel was told that if for, for a period of time, that if you worship any other god except for the, the, the Darius, Darius, then you will be thrown into the lion's den. He recognized that that was not a flesh and blood alone thing. He recognized that that was a principality and power because 
Daniel had been used by God with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, because of Daniel's life and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's consistency, eventually became a follower of God himself. And as Babylon got overtaken and the Medes and Persians took over Babylon, now Darius was told by some people who are hating on Daniel because he was the highest of the three uh, leaders underneath Darius. And they said, O king, let this be set forth that people cannot worship any other God. And when, if they would be thrown the fire, I mean, to the lion's den. And when that happened, when Daniel heard it, the Bible tells us that as his custom was, he opened up the windows. As his custom was, he prayed to God. As his custom was, he asked God to take control and God took control. We're not rest against flesh and blood. When we look even later on in the book of Daniel, Daniel is now praying because God was speaking to him and he was trying to find an answer. But the Bible tells us that, that, that Gabriel came and said, oh, Daniel, greatly beloved, from the moment you were praying, I was coming, God sent me to come, but, but the Prince of Persia came forth. The Bible tells us that we are not dealing with this flesh and blood thing. We're dealing with the principalities and powers Satan has brought forth to cause disruption and distractions so that it will disrupt our development in Jesus Christ. Family, we got to be mindful and we got to continue to pray. We got to continue to make sure that we have on the whole armor. The whole armor is something that's going to give us strength and it's going to protect us. Family, I want to share with you that we got to continue to hold on to God's unchanging hand. Family, I want to share with you right now is that we cannot give up on God and we got to put on what God has for us because God knows what's best for us. He has allowed us to be alive today, this fifth day of, of, of September, 2020. God has allowed breath to be in our lungs right now at this time of 1036. He could have taken away any time, but because he has had this on us, in us, he's having us in a situation so that he can get us ready to see him when he comes back. And his armor is the only thing that can be used against Satan's plots and plans. And even in that Satan knows that his time is short and he will send distractions to disrupt your development. Finally, point number three is this, is that as God's armor can handle God, Satan's plots and plans, as Satan sends forth distractions to disrupt your development, here's the next thing, is that the commission is for your condition. Someone say the commission is for your condition. See, see it's not just if you want to put on the whole armor of God, this is a commission to put on the whole armor of God. Verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, I don't know about you, but if you want to be in a pit with a lion, it will be good that you have something to protect you. The devil is stronger than any earthly lion. The devil knows that his time is short. And the devil knows that each person that makes it to, to heaven is the sins that Satan will be responsible for in tempting them. When we understand of the sanctuary service, the day of atonement, God directs the high priest to go into the most holy place, interceding with the blood on the mercy seat. And when all the sins of those who confessed their sins and got them all out, they were atoned for. But anyone who did not get them atoned for, they were removed out the camp. They were no longer part of camp. In fact, they actually died and were removed out the camp. But those who were atoned, who repented of their sins, then the high priest will go to the second goat, called the Azazel goat, and place his hand on the Azazel goat and put his hand on it to transfer the sins from the, from, from the camp unto this goat and a strong man will take that goat out and take him to an uninhabited land. That is, that Zell goat is symbolic of Satan. Every person who makes it to heaven, all their sins have been atoned for, will one day, God will fully make the transfer from the, the temple and transfer them over to Satan. And on him, he will have to suffer the responsibility of the sins of the people he calls to commit. That's why we have to put on the whole armor of God, because if we do not put on the whole armor of God, Satan will overtake us 
and we will still be in our sins and we will die in our sins. So this commission is for your condition to put on the whole armor of God. What am I talking about? Let's, let's read it. Verse 13. Here's the things that we got to do. Verse 13 tells us right here. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14 says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking a shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one, of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. See, see, that is the commission for our condition. Now, now we're going to go back over this. See, it, first of all, it said that we need to put on the, the we need to gird ourselves, gird ourselves right now in, in, on our ways with the truth, uh, with truth. The, the, the truth is in Christ. Now, I asked you at the beginning of the message, before I started preaching, I asked you to get your sheet of paper or your tablet and get a pen or type this in, because we're going to go over some scriptures. In the truth of, in Christ, these are some scriptures we can be reminded of. See, when we recognize that the truth in Christ is his word, when we read his word, this is what the Bible tells us. It says, John 17, 17 through 19, and it says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they, all, they also may be sanctified by the truth. See, when we are, have a truth in Christ, it holds up everything. Now, now, what am I talking about? Let's make this practical. If you are a person who wears pants, that is an amen. This for this aspect. For those who wear pants and you do not need to wear a belt, that can be something of good or bad. Sometimes you're wearing a, you, maybe you have pants that are the perfect fit. Or maybe they're pants that are just a little bit too tight and you can't put a belt on because you put a belt on and be even tighter. But most people, when you put on a pair of pants, you put on a belt. The belt holds up your pants. It is the middle thing that holds it. And for you wearing a shirt and you tuck your shirt in, it keeps your shirt from getting disheveled and coming out of, from the pants that you tucked inside of. It, it, this is your, this is what holds and girdles. This is what holds you up. It's a truth in Christ. So when we are being sanctified by reading the word, we are being found solidly in the truth that is in Christ. In this order, this is how they do it. So that's, that's so the first one. You put on the verse we just read. Is that you put on the, the waist of the girdle with the waist of truth. The second thing is, is that we now put on, have to put on a breastplate, a breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is this. It's the life of the believer. When you look at this armor, this is with the, with the, with the uh, scales. It's to, use, to be used to, to cover up the, 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 the attacks of the enemy. The attacks of the enemy may be a sword or, or a spear, and as a spirit may try to come, these scales will protect them. It's the life of the believer from the front and the back. And that's why we can look in a book that says Isaiah 59, verse 17. It says, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. So this breastplate is righteousness. Let's look again. It says, 1 Thessalonians 5 8, that this breastplate of righteousness says, Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. So, our righteousness, our protection is our faith in Christ and our love for our brothers and sisters. Come on, y'all. That is the life of the believer. When we are shod and we are prepared and we are covered with this breastplate of righteousness, we are right with God. And we are right with our brothers. That's why when it comes to communion, we, we pray if we have an ought with them. We're not just eating of the bread and drinking of the wine. If we have an ought with somebody, we need to talk to them. Because anything that will try to divide and destroy, Satan will try to do that. If he can see a weakness in the body of believers, hear a roar to have the people scattered, and he'll focus on the weak person that he can get. And we do not want to be a people 
who Satan will try to divide. We are so tight together that Satan cannot attack us. Can somebody say amen? But even in that, we personally had to have on us our breastplate of righteousness, which is the breastplate of faith and love. The next thing we're going to look at is, we're going to go down, verse 15 says, and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. See, this is what it is. See, this is not necessary to just run, but this right here is to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet, in the context of this passage, is saying that we have to have a sure footing in Jesus Christ. That's why it says in Romans 5 verse 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When Peter was being in a position of, of, of about to be killed the next day, and, and right before the angel goes through those 16 soldiers and, and they, fall, they fall out, they, they fall out and, and the angel has to wake Peter up. Peter was about to be killed the next day, but because Peter was so, was, had such a strong footing in Jesus Christ, he didn't care if he, was gonna, if he would have died. He had that kind of peace in Jesus. We got to have that kind of peace in Jesus as well. When, when, when Paul and Silas were thrown into the prison, they weren't crying and moaning and, and, and yelping and, and being afraid. The Bible tells us that they were singing and, and having a hallelujah good time because they had peace in Jesus Christ. When the, when the, when the enemy, when the, when the inmates saw them and they saw that they were singing, when the earthquake came and, and, and what normally would have been done by inmates, when they were able to be free, they had such a connection with Paul and Silas, because Paul and Silas had such a connection with Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that the jailer would have killed himself because if one would have fled, he would have been responsible for them. He was about to kill himself, but Paul said, don't be afraid, we're all here. Paul and Silas's connection with God was so strong that the prisoners, even though they could have fled, were so gravitated by the life of Paul and Silas that they didn't flee because they saw the sure footing that Paul and Silas had. And Peter had such a sure footing in Jesus Christ that he didn't care if he died the next day, he was just gonna go to sleep and just rest in the assurances of Christ. That's why we can be like Job, that even though situations may come our way, even though adversity may afflict us, we can say, I know who my, I know my Redeemer liveth. And even though worms may eat my body, yet in my eyes, I shall see God. We can have a sure footing when we are in the word of God, we're in prayer, where we're in Christ, we can have that peace that no matter what comes our way, we know we have an anchor that keeps still the soul. No matter what comes, when the winds and the waves and the billows come, if Jesus is the captain of our ship, we can smile at the storm. If you understand what I'm saying, you can say amen right now. We can have peace in Jesus Christ. Paul continues on. The next thing he says is that next we got to have on is we have to have on, uh, 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 um, let's get on. He said, have on the, 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 the shield of faith, verse 16. The shield of faith will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. This is something for protection. And let's look what it says in the Bible. First John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. This is our protection, our faith. As the devil tries to attack you, the devil tries to destroy you, we have to have faith in Jesus. Let's look at more. Romans 1.17. For in it is the righteousness of God as is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When we have our faith and our trust and our confidence in God, it protects us even when it seems like all going away. When John the Baptist was getting nervous, when he asked his, his disciples to go to Jesus and say, are you he that should come or should we look for another? And Jesus points to them of what he's doing, the healings, the miracles that he's performing. And they go back and tell John the Baptist, even though John the Baptist was in prison, he had faith in God. And even though he lost his life, his faith in God is ultimately in preparing 
for when Jesus comes back. When we keep faith, no matter the attacks that we go to, it is a protection for us. And two others we're going to go over is the, the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is like it covers your head. And you know what your head has. Your head has your brain. Your head also has a frontal lobe. That is the thinking part of it. It's a processing part. Protected. The frontal lobe, the head, where it's protected by this, 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 this helmet of salvation, is basically the place of will and intelligence. First Thessalonians 5, 8, again, we just read it earlier, but I'm focusing on the second part. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. It is the hope of salvation. None of us have seen God come back yet. But in our minds, we can have confidence that this very thing that he has done, he will complete it to the end. If you've seen what God has done in your life when you were struggling on drugs, when you were struggling with illicit relationships, when you were struggling violence, when you were struggling crime, when you see how God has taken you from what you once were to where you are right now, come on, say amen. You can also have a recognition that if God has done this then, if God did that then, He's going to come back and take us home to be with him forevermore. And we can have in our heads the hope and the anticipation of salvation. That's why the Bible says, we will shout when Jesus comes back. Lo, this is our God, and we have waited for him. In our heads, we have in our minds the recognition and the anticipation that Jesus is coming back. That is our hope and our, sal uh, our hope of salvation. It's that peace and the assurance that Jesus is mine and whatever is on this world is going to go away and we will see the glory divine. Amen. The last one is the, the sword. It says right here, in the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, we have to have the word. It's the only article of this armor that is both for defensive and it also is used for the offensive. Offensive. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is something that is used in aggressive service to attack flesh, the parts of the body that need to be cut off. God has the word that will cut us, and that's going to get us refined to see Jesus come back. These all together, putting together, we're praying always, and, and, and to come together is to get us prepared to see Jesus when he comes back. That's why when the man has on, when a woman has on the full armor of God, that they are able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, we got to be fair, we got to be familiar. Like I told you earlier, there are different formations, the turtle, the surrounding, to protect them all around. There's the point that they're here to stand. The soldiers stand. Then the soldiers are in a military position that they can march and to attack from the, the things that come up by the opposition. But also they stand, they march, and they also are mouth set up to attack. Family, this spiritual battle is important right here because I want to share this at this moment, is that yes, this spiritual battle is for us to fight, but we also have to fight it in the realization that we are not to fight this battle alone. God has brought forth us in a church setting. God has brought us right now to be in a group setting for us to come to, 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 to in this process, to be in a group of believers called the church. We are at Maranatha Fellowship as a body of believers that not just one person will attack the enemy, but that we all will attack the enemy. Because if we don't attack the enemy, the devil will try to scatter us and to attack us. But when we are together in Christ, there is nothing that the enemy can do to defeat us. Can somebody say amen? That's why it's important when we look at it. And, 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 and it's called discipleship. There's this book that's been written, and, and as I'm going to look at this some more, I'm going, to, I'm going to get this book and I'm going to look at some things, but I looked at some portion of it, and it, it highlights three things. It, it covers these aspects. It covers a head. As it covers a head, this is what happens when a disciple, in, in the process of the discipleship, a, a person will come to church 
and they will hear with their head to follow Christ. But not only does it just focus on the head, but it also goes to the heart. Because when it goes to the head of following Christ, there's some people who just follow Christ by going to church. But if Christ has not touched the heart and that causes them to be changed by Christ, that's good too. But the discipleship of Jesus Christ to, his, to the disciples, which includes us as well, is that we have the head, we have to have a heart, we must follow and be changed, but then ultimately it also has to be, we also have to be the hands. The head, the heart, and the hands to do the mission of Christ. This Sabbath school lesson, this Sabbath school lesson is speaking about that right now, the mission of Christ, the joy of sharing in his mission. Once we have known what Jesus Christ has done for us in our heads, we made a decision to follow him. But when we recognize, as Pastor Hernandez said, the 18 inches from the head to the heart, when we see from the head to the heart of what Christ has done in our hearts, how we have been changed by Christ, it will then go with the heart pumping blood to give energy to the hands to do work, the mission of Christ. And we have to make friends. And I don't want to go too far, but... I, I, I must say this, is that this Sabbath school lesson was truly a blessing and a charge. See, the Sabbath school lesson this week, and I know we're going to go over it, and I'm not going to go too far into it, but it was speaking about small groups. And as it's speaking about small groups, these are groups of people who may not be coming to the church, but are coming together in small groupings of common ground, different, probably similar age ranges, uh, similar perspectives or likes and various things. You can have a cooking group and make that into a small group where you're showing people how to cook healthier. And as you're cooking healthier, then you can point them to the word of God of, that the health of physical health is also helping us to live longer to worship God who created us in his image. We can use that. We can connect with both fellow believers and our community. We can use that in our small group. We can use maybe somebody who knows how to fix and work on cars and, tells, tell, and, and use that as, as an aspect of, yeah, we're going to talk about this process and how to work on an automobile in this way. And then go to the word of God and do the same thing. It could be about parenting skills. It could be about various things. These are small groups that are coming forth ultimately to accomplish the mission. And if you, and, and, and the moderator of the Sabbath school lesson, I hope we were able to touch on what was spoken about yesterday on Friday about that European church that was about to die. But when they started going over the aspect of the small groups thing, God led them to see the change that happened at that church. See, family, I share with you right now is that we are in this battle and we are in this battle together. God has called for the body of believers to be galvanized and work together. And we must put on us the full armor of God, the whole armor of God. Nothing else can divert Satan except on what God has told us to do because the commission that he's given us is for our condition to prepare us to see Jesus when he comes back. This is what his wife says. She says, Satan, would, Satan watches eagerly to find Christians off their guard. Oh, that the followers of Christ would remember their eternal vigilance is the price of eternal life. Many have a slumbering faith, and unless they are invigorated, revived, quickened into action, their souls will be lost. Self must die, and Christ must be enthroned in the heart as all and in all. The thoughts must be stayed on him, then the life will be an honor to his name. The soul will receive power from on high to resist Satan's specious disguises. Has Seventh-day Adventists forgotten the warning given in the sixth chapter of Ephesians? We are engaged in a warfare against a host of darkness, and unless we follow our leader closely, Satan will obtain the victory over us. I tell you right now, family, is that Maranatha Fellowship, 106 Saluda Dam Road, it's a wonderful building, but it is not the church. 106 Saluda Dam Road is still standing up. We are still paying a mortgage on it, even though we have not been in the building for, for six months. It is a beautiful building, but it is not the church. The church is where God says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. 
So yes, it is a building that was built for the purpose of worship services, but until the body of believers come inside, it is not the church. It's a place of worship. The church is what we're doing right now. So Jesus is not coming to save 106 Salute the Damn Road. He's coming to save each and every one of us under the sound of my voice. And as we come together, as we come to serve God, as we come to appreciate what God has done for us, as we allow God to change us from the inside out, and as we allow God to take what he's done from the inside out, that we can transfer it over to our brothers and sisters and our neighbors who don't know about Jesus and that person who's hopeless and helpless on the corner and that person who thinks that their body can be used to make money, when we transfer that in love to them, what a wonderful change can happen to Greenville. Can somebody say amen? That's the reason why God has called us to stand for him, but we must use the whole armor of God. We can't use anything else to deviate it. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, of what we need to do, in particular 13 to 17, of what we need to stand in those evil and wicked times with Satan. It's a story. Stories about South Africa and coastline. Coastline South Africa, they were having some problems. They were having sharks that were infested in the area, and people were nervous and afraid and uh, didn't go venture out too much uh, because they didn't want out, they were afraid of being attacked by sharks. And so they would try to set up nets to, to buffer out the, the sharks and keep the sharks away. But they also had another problem. As they put up these nets, the sharks would get taken. But also what these nets did was they killed other, uh, other fish, other, um, other sea animals. So they had to come to an understanding of what they need to do to get rid of the sharks. And they came to this advice, this device, and this device was come, some kind of like a sonar that was done kind of to, 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 to separate the sharks. It was some kind of wave that was sent into the water that made the sharks flee from the area. And I've just come to tell you right now is that that even now, family, we have the devil that on earth, he's kind of like, if we use an earthly application, he's like a roaring lion. But if we use a water application, he's like a devouring shark. And he will try to tear up, rip up, destroy all. But even though other things may seemingly block, try to block the enemy, it will attack other things. But one thing we have is Jesus Christ who will divert the attacks of Satan. And it's completely safe. It will not destroy people. Jesus has told us that he did not come to kill. He came, he came not to seek to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Satan's done. But he said, I have come that they may have life and have it the more abundantly. In Jesus Christ, we have our peace. In Jesus Christ, we have our assurance. In Jesus Christ, we have our safety. In Jesus Christ, we have our assurance. In Jesus Christ, we have our hope. And it is a hope that burns through our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. But even though, still, I'm going to read it one more time, Paul tells us that as we're hoping, this way he says again, finally, my brethren, be strong, the Lord, and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So you must stand therefore first, having girded your waist with truth, truth in Christ. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the life of the believer, and trust in God, faith in God having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, a sure footing in the word of God. Verse 16 says, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The, the, the word of God is for our protection. Take upon us the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. The helmet is the, the assurance of salvation. And the sword is for an offensive attack to attack, to destroy the devil, and also to take away the simple things in our lives. And these, which is the word of God, praying always and with all prayer and supplication and spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 
We're not in this by ourselves. We're in this together as a family. And I just want to share this with you for those, those who especially those who are newly baptized. Just a reminder, we're in this thing together. Put it on the chat line. We're in this thing together, everybody. We're in this thing together. Put it down because we're not going to be attacked by the devil if we, are, if we have on the whole arm of God, if we have peace in Jesus Christ and the assurance of Jesus Christ and ultimately the hope of Jesus Christ. If you believe the word of God, please raise your hands with me right now because God is trying to save us and he wants to save as many as he can, including the community around us. They are looking for Christ and as they're looking for Christ, they will see Christ through us because we have on the whole armor of God. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Father God, thank you so very much today. Lord, we thank you for the community that you've placed us in. Christ, you put together the church. You are the chief cornerstone. We, have com we make components of, the, the, of, of, of it, of the church. But Lord, you are the foundation and the, and the, and the, and the, and the sole reason why we exist. Lord, because of your death, Lord, we have, an, we have life through you. Thank you. So God, we pray that what you have told Paul some 2,000 years ago, that we will put that in our lives right now and put on the whole armor, not half. We need to be fully protected from the wiles of the devil. And Lord, when we do all we can, we can stand in you. And so Lord, as the devil's like a shark roaring and wave going through the waters, Lord, we, we thank you that you're not a net that, that will kill other things. But Lord, you have a wave, which is your word, that will divert and distort and, and separate the, the enemy and keep us at peace from all things around us. So Lord God, we pray for the peace that pass all understanding. We pray for the, the hope that burns within our hearts. And Lord, we pray for the day when you come back that we will be numbered with those that we cannot number because you are looking to save us all. Keep us, God, we pray. Be with our communities and be with us as we will serve the community. And I pray for our future small groups that will be in development. This I thank in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.